it's amazing to think that in this instance, the entire career field of having stewardesses on airplanes, or in this case, flight attendants now of all kinds on any airline in the, in the entire world, that entire career field started here in our state and in our capital city. Having grown up here in Cheyenne, Wyoming, everybody looks at that airfield that sits in the middle of our city and wonder why is it there. Cheyenne had an important part to play with the creation of our national airline transport system. The way that transformed the city of Cheyenne and later on what the contributions of these people in Cheyenne made to the development of our modern concept of air travel is outstanding. The U.S. military was the first to utilize Cheyenne as an aviation hub. They conducted an air reliability test to prove that aircraft could be used to protect both coasts of the United States. And so they found this location which was perfect. It could be supplied by train. It was right next to a military post that had uh, a lot of land around it. And then also the fact that it was, uh, again, thanks to the railroad, a landmark that the pilots could follow without getting lost and relying on sometimes very unreliable gear. Uh, they would be able to uh, transit uh, the continent from Chicago to San Francisco by just following the Union Pacific Railroad. Otto Prager of the United States Postal Service took note of this air reliability test. He thought air travel could be a way to make mail delivery much more efficient. This uh, test by the Army was able to prove that it was possible to have something go coast to coast in daylight hours in as little as 21 hours. And so uh, it was decided that they would move a new civilian airfield to this plateau about a mile north of the state capitol building. And that is where the airfield is today and the city has grown up around it. But from the very get-go this was a very well-placed location. In 1926 the Kelly Airmail Act was passed. Airmail service would now be privatized. But part of the act stipulated that these commercial entities that took on airmail routes would also be required to take passengers. The company that was really interested in buying the largest of these airmail routes, ours, was this company by the name of Boeing Aircraft Corporation under Bill Boeing, the legendary aircraft designer. And so he began to build airplanes that would be able to do both, carry airmail and people. They were some of the first airliners that he ever developed. One of the first was basically a biplane, a little bigger than the airmail planes that came before, called the Boeing 40. You know, the pilot sat outside in the wind. That's where the pilots thought they should be. But the place that he put the people was between the pilot and the engine in the fuselage of the plane in a space that could hold four people, surprisingly, but it's really small. If people were brave enough to try this, and there were some daredevils who were willing, you would not have help as a passenger from the pilot. He couldn't hear you until he landed at the next location. Bill Boeing decided to build his company's headquarters in Cheyenne due to its central location along the airmail route. And when he did that, that made Cheyenne the largest aviation depot in the Rocky Mountain region. At the same time that he was doing that, he designed another airplane, and this one was called the Boeing 80, also designed to carry passengers, but this time inside an enclosed cabin. Even the pilot and co-pilot were able to sit on the inside. It had three engines, and it was supposed to be appointed like a Pullman car on a railroad. You had walnut paneled walls, you had uh, wicker seats with leather cushions, you had china sconces with brass fixtures. Uh, it was absolutely luxurious, but unfortunately, even with this brand new airplane, they still could not convince people to fly. Steve Stimson, office manager of Boeing Air Transport's San Francisco office, presented the idea of using stewards on flights, like on ocean liners, to take care of passengers' needs. And as he was formulating this idea, a woman walks into his office looking for a job in aviation. She was a recent graduate nurse from French Hospital in San Francisco. Her name was Ellen Church. Well, as he started thinking about these ideas, he struck upon this idea with her help that instead of having male stewards, what if you had female stewardesses who would be willing to go back, take care of the passengers? And uh, he supplied this idea to his superiors in Cheyenne, Wyoming. They realized that maybe this would be a perfect thing to try to encourage the flying public to do this amazing step of getting into the air. And so they hired eight young ladies to fly to Cheyenne, Wyoming, 
where the airline would train them on the finer points of what would it be to be a steward or stewardess on an airplane. They trained them for four days in May of 1930. They eventually took off and four flew from Cheyenne to San Francisco, four took off from Cheyenne to Chicago. Neither the passengers or the crews took very long to realize just how valuable these young ladies were. And very shortly, Boeing Air Transport saw an uptick in people that wanted to fly on their airline. Other airlines saw this as well and liked the service and began to do this too. The stewardess school was an experimental idea. Nobody knew exactly what form it was going to take. Mr. Stimson actually was very important in trying to get this done. From the very beginning, he did this with Ellen Church, uh, they designed what would be necessary to be good uh, stewards, or stewardesses rather, on these aircraft. Early stewardesses had this amazing panoply of things that you can't imagine that stewardesses or flight attendants would do today. They would have to be registered nurses. They were responsible for checking bags, weighing the passengers, loading the bags onto the aircraft, uh, dusting the windowsills, tightening down the seats after every landing to make sure that they didn't come loose on the next landing. Uh, of course, they serve food, the swatted flies, but they are also seen in many instances pushing airplanes into hangars and helping refuel the aircraft. Stuff that <laughs> sounds absolutely remarkable today. And so it was a matter of trial and error over decades to eventually get to the profession that we understand it today. There was one rule that stuck with the stewardesses from the very beginning, was the fact if you got married, you had to resign. And so this is something that continued from the 1930s all the way up until 1974, that no stewardess, when any airline, was allowed to be married. But that also meant the turnover was incredible. In 1930, large-scale mergers were happening within the airline industry. Boeing Air Transport became part of what is now United Airlines, and United was headquartered in Chicago, but maintained an operations base in Cheyenne. All the aircraft that United Airlines flew, no matter which one of these branches that they used to belong to, were brought to Cheyenne, Wyoming for maintenance. During the early days, there was one stewardess per plane. But when United started using the Douglas DC-3, the amount of passengers doubled, and United started using more than one stewardess on each flight. By the time we got the DC-3 into United Airlines inventory, the federal government mandated that for every 10 people on a plane, there must be a stewardess. And that became kind of a new standard that was regulated. Shortly after the United merger, the company decided to move the stewardess school to Chicago. Cheyenne, serving as the company's maintenance base and modification center through World War II. After the war, these facilities moved from Wyoming to San Francisco. All of the airlines basically came to the conclusion that it was far better and more efficient to fly from somewhere to somewhere. So why not go from Chicago to San Francisco in a straight flight in these aircraft that could make the distance? They no longer had to stop in the middle and refuel. With all the changes, they didn't want to let Cheyenne swing in the wind or leave us out in the cold. They wanted to continue their relationship with our community here in Wyoming. And so beginning in 1947, they started implementing the training program, the training school for United here at Cheyenne. They had dormitories for the ladies, they had a cafeteria for them, they had uh, classrooms, they had mock-ups of this new DC-4 airliner that uh, they would be able to train these new stewardesses in. And the instructors that they brought were all professional stewardesses that were actually in the airline. So the training level went from four days at the beginning, and here in 1947 the training was up to five weeks. And what they had to be trained in was for a brand new aviation industry, because now after World War II, flight was now a given in modern life. And they needed something, I believe in the first year, 600 new stewardesses in that year to meet the new demand. Unfortunately, the, all good things must come to an end. And for Cheyenne, the end came with its connection with United Airlines in 1961. United decided that it was a good idea to build a brand new school for the stewardesses right next to their headquarters back in Chicago. And so unfortunately, after graduating upwards of 7,000 stewardesses, eventually United decided to close that business and Cheyenne has been poorer for it ever since. Mike and a fellow researcher, Starley Talbot, have written two books about the history of aviation in Wyoming, including one published in the summer of 2020 about the stewardess training program in Cheyenne. 
I thoroughly enjoyed everything that I discovered about uh, what happened here in our city. That at one point we were the center of the aviation world. Uh, that all the airlines used to come to Cheyenne and go to the Plains Hotel to have the meetings that would define the future course of the industry for that year. Uh, instead of Denver or instead of San Francisco or Chicago, they came here. And the fact that it was here in Cheyenne that we had this stewardess profession, that now every airline in the world that holds its salt as a major carrier for passengers or otherwise must have flight attendants to take care of their passengers. That started here. And I think that's a feather in our cap that we don't talk enough about and we really should be proud about our contribution.